Lecture 9, A Life Perfectly Lived. Our previous lecture talked about the origins of Jesus Christ. Our next lecture will talk about his death and resurrection. But I want to take the time to talk about the events of Jesus' life that came in between. Specifically, we will discuss his early life, his upbringing, his baptism, his temptation, the transfiguration, the miracles. And in each one of these cases, we're discussing what these things mean. What's the point of every one of these events? But there's more. In each case, we're going to see demonstrated two elements or two themes that recur in every one of the events. And that is actually a broad pattern for the life of Jesus Christ. Number one, we're going to recognize that every event of his life points to his coming death. And so the structure of Jesus' life itself centers, as the Gospels do, around the climactic event. People have even talked about the Gospels as a passion narrative with an extended introduction. That, that's a bit of a hyperbolic statement. It's a, it's a bit of exaggeration. But in some cases, it feels like that. John 13 and following focuses on the events of Jesus' death and resurrection and then the interpretation of that. And everything that comes before is so pointed and so specifically focused on the death that you can see this idea being true, that the book itself is setting up for the climactic event of Jesus' life. And so, as I just said, the events of Jesus' life themselves constantly point to the climax of his life, which is his death. But there's something else, and that is that Jesus' life functions as an example or a paradigm for all of us. So uh, think about biographies one of the most time-tested and proven genres of literature. And thinking through someone's life with the advantage of uh, someone living afterwards, and we can look back and reflect on the decisions they made, the significance of those decisions, and whether that entire life was well lived, so that in 500 pages you can cover an entire lifetime of a person. Well, part of the benefit of biographies, then, is whatever wisdom you can glean about how to live well. And you see some of the choices that people made that were good choices, wise choices, profitable, and others not so much. You're looking at the example of their life in order to learn how to live well. So also our Savior. In fact, the New Testament itself tells us that part of what we're gaining from hearing and seeing the life of Jesus Christ is that if you want to know what it would mean for a human being to live well, put this into the category of Old Testament wisdom. How would you live successfully? What is a life well lived? Jesus Christ defines the paradigm. He is the standard of living well, and he shows you that in every respect of his life. Let's start then with the beginning, Jesus' early life. And we have a very helpful summary, Luke 2.52, takes some of these concepts and states it quite succinctly. Luke 2.52, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and favor with man. And I think that's a really helpful summary of what I'll call, roughly speaking, four categories of human growth, four categories of growing in living well. So intellectual, he grew in wisdom. Physical, he grew in stature. Relational, spiritual, he grew in favor with God. And relationally, social, so growing in favor with man. And I think those four categories fairly effectively summarize how a person ought to grow in their own development as a human being. Here, as categories that we might use, roughly summarizing that, spiritual growth, physical growth, social, and intellectual growth. I've drawn these as overlapping categories, and I think that's important. Let's recognize that you want all of these categories growing together. You see significantly for our purposes here that Jesus did just that. In each one of these four categories, you see his flourishing is increasing his growth. And the, the remarkable thing is that we're talking about the eternal Son of God, who now 
is setting for us an example of what it looks like to be a faithful human being as a child. So as I've thought even and used this practically with my own family, this then sets out an example for what we're aiming to do. How do you live life well as an adult? How do you live life well as a child? Here are categories and here are ways that we ought to be seeking to flourish and increase in order to maximally use our lives to the honor and glory of God. What would it have been like to know Jesus during these years, the early years of his childhood? We'll observe in a little bit that scripture is remarkably silent about these years, and we'll explore some of the reasons for that. I would just like to contrast here initially with some of the imaginative ways that various pieces of literature have tried to extend this out. Because naturally enough, we're curious about the question. We'd like to know what Jesus was like as a child. Scripture doesn't give us much information, and so we're tempted to fill in the gaps and make things up. And there are various pieces of literature. The Infancy Gospel of Thomas, which is an apocryphal book. It's probably not written by the, God, by the disciple Thomas at all, and it's not in any case part of the biblical canon has some stories like this. Uh, one of the stories, Jesus is playing in, in a little stream, and he's creating little ponds like a child would. And as he's doing that, he makes the water pure in one of those little ponds, just with a command, a miracle. And then he starts making little sparrows out of clay. And so he's molding them, creating these. And other boys are playing with him. It's on the Sabbath day. And they run to his father and they say, your son has violated the Sabbath because he's making something. And Joseph goes there to rebuke him and ask, what are you doing? And Jesus speaks to the sparrows and says, fly away and remember me. Become alive. And the sparrows immediately, these little mud sparrows, immediately take life and they fly away. And everyone's watching, and then the Jews are angry and they go off and they report to the leaders what Jesus had done. It sounds like somebody who has read the actual Gospels and then started imagining things. And actually the Quran picks this story up and includes it. There are other stories like this, a story of Jesus as a child, as an infant, speaking full adult sentences. I mean, just still a freshly born baby, but he looks up and he speaks and these kinds of things. Well, what I think is happening here is that in the attempt to show Jesus uniqueness, people are actually breaking down and destroying his full humanity. In other words, you end up with someone who's not actually fully human. And, and you get even things like this in some of our favorite hymns. One of our hymns, A Christmas Carol, says the little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes as he's laying in the manger or as he's freshly born. That's not realistic. Did Jesus cry? Of course he cried. And all of the normal aspects of humanity that you would expect Jesus lived all of that. He lived it all perfectly, without sin, but he was fully human. What would it have been like, I asked, to live with Jesus during these years? What would it have been like to know him as a child or as an infant? And as I said, I don't know that we're supposed to go there and examine this because scripture itself doesn't take us there except this. I, I think we're supported biblically enough to say that you should not expect that Jesus as a child or as an infant had some kind of a holy glow, a halo over his head like you see in all the Renaissance paintings. Or if you looked into his eyes, then you immediately knew something was different. I suspect, on the contrary, that to have known Jesus as a child, you, you would have thought, you know, he was eminently normal. He, he, was, he was a child. He... he learned child things. He grew in language skills and walking around, and he grew up like a child would. And part of the reason I, I, I would support this, biblically speaking, is that we have some passages that go there. So this is Mark 6. Jesus went to his own country, came to his own hometown. When the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. Watch people's reaction. They know him, right? He grew, grew up in this town. Many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence, meaning from where, 
Does he have these things? What wisdom is this which is given into him that even such mighty works are wrought or done by his hands? How does he do these miracles? And these are the people that are in his hometown. They would have known him. And we're going to have this confirmed. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? The brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon. They know his brothers. They know the children that came after him. Are not his sisters here with us? They know them even up until that day. The sisters are still at home, are still there in the hometown. And these people are offended at him. Because they can't explain how someone whom they knew, the one they call the carpenter, could have this power. And Jesus' answer to that is that a prophet is not without honor except in his own country. He's rejected because people assume, how could he have anything different than us? And similar to that later, the brothers of Jesus, whom we just met, their names were just read, neither did his brethren believe in him. So you, you don't get at all the impression that growing up across these years, people saw continual miracles or a holy glow or anything like this. In fact, I would want to defend on the contrary that Jesus' upbringing would in so many ways have been eminently normal. Okay, he was a child. He grew up among us. And yet I'll take this one step further. I, I would also suspect that as you then thought about that upbringing, as someone might say, yeah, a normal child. I mean, he even, he even I'm sure, misbehaved. I, I'm sure he even did bad things like, like normal children do. Like that, well, um, um, you know, well, I'm sure there's something. No? And kind of the notion that someone would assume, maybe by not noticing, that he was a completely normal child like every other child until they stopped to ponder and realized that, you know, he never actually did do anything bad. And come to think of it, he never did misbehave, I guess. Oh, interesting. And part of my support for that is, if you continue watching with the brothers, the brothers reject you get out further and you discover that the brothers have become believers. That the brothers are part of the early leadership of the church. It's possible that the books of James and Jude are written by brothers of Jesus. In any case, it's clear that they eventually, including his mother, do become believers in him. And so it's not as though anyone can point to some contradicting information. Oh, I knew him as a child and he was a mess. Nobody can. At the end, they also finally come to worship him as Lord. Because though he's fully human, he's also entirely unique. We just looked a bit ago at Luke 2.52. I'd like to go back and look at the context of that passage. So starting with the, the statement that we read, describing or summarizing Jesus' growth in wisdom, stature, favor with God and man. Okay, that's a summary statement at the end. The interesting thing about this passage is there's a similar summary statement at the beginning. The child grew, waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom. The grace of God was upon him. So a summary statement at the beginning and at the end, and the content in the middle now illustrates this. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And they fulfilled the days. As they're returning, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. Now, I'd like to comment here. This is the child Jesus. We've give, been given an age 12 years old. If you know a 12-year-old, or maybe you can find a 12-year-old to help you imagine what that would look like. Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a the big city. And so he's, he's back there unaccompanied. Joseph and his mother knew not of it. I think even that language is an interesting just distinction. It's not to say jo Jesus' father and mother knew of it. Joseph and his mother, rem remember the virgin birth distinction. They, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey. And I think the idea is you've got a large group. They're all going up together for the Passover, and the group leaves together. And so, okay, I, I'm sure someone says, I, I think I saw him with this group over here. Oh, okay, okay. They sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance a day out. It's a long way. When they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. And this is a significant inconvenience now. Now you're not part of the company. Because the entire company going along, now you've got to travel by yourself, which is not as safe. It came to pass after three days 
But you already had the journey out, the journey back, and so you're assuming getting now two days in journey and three days now wondering about five days have elapsed. They find him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. Now, I mean, if you're a parent or if you know a parent, to have lost a child for five days, right? The mother and the father, too, are basically hysterical by now. Where on earth is he? Is he dead? And they find him not running about the streets, scrounging for food, sitting in the temple. Not a typical 12-year-old thing to do. Sitting in the midst of the doctors, hearing them and asking questions. A comment here, to have a 12-year-old who is able, capable of sitting among the docs, doctors, and whom the doctors allow to be there, is something extraordinary is happening. And it's not just that Jesus is teaching them. He's hearing them and asking them questions. The astonishing thing about this is that Jesus is showing you the picture of wisdom. Remember Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, wisdom that listens and hears and learns. He's listening, and I think this even represents the concept of growth. He's paying attention to what they said. But he's not just hearing. All that heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers, which is part of the reason that he's captivated the attention, attention of the doctors. So that nobody's sitting there, and, and, and as we've said just a moment ago, seeing him as a, an angelic glowing figure. I mean, they're, they're seeing him as a child that sat down amongst them, but a child that is unique. Where on earth is this giftedness from? When they saw him, they were amazed. Now, this is the mother and the father that are amazed. Now, again, it supports my idea that I don't think you're seeing a kind of a holy glow and, oh yeah, well, he's always doing miracles like this. He, he plays with sparrows and gives them life. I don't, think, I don't think that's the impression you're getting. Even the, parents, even the parents are amazed at what happened. And they ask questions like, why have you dealt, dealt with us like this? Your father and I have sought thee sorrowing. <laughs> right, five days worth. Um, here, I think there's the recognition that Jesus Christ, the perfect Son of God, there would have been, at times, social conflict. In other words, the mother comes and misunderstands or is upset and somewhat, I, I, I don't want to say justifiably, but you can understand why. You can understand why she's bothered. Five days. Of course, we were stressed out. And he said unto them, how is it that you sought me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? They understood not the saying which he spake unto them. He went down with them, came to Nazareth, was subject, subject unto them, but his mother kept all these things in her heart. You're recognizing that his parents themselves are processing what it means to raise this child. They don't understand everything he says. And one other comment or insight I'd like to draw out of this that's just striking. Jesus recognizes, or Jesus speaks on the one hand, about a higher priority. I must be about my father's business. Even while at the same time, he still subjects himself to his parents. So that takes me then to make the point that I've said I would like to argue for each one of these layers. The first, Jesus' early life, and I, I said I would demonstrate with each one of these that Jesus is our ultimate example for life. If you want to know how to live life well, Jesus shows you that. But also that each one of these events points to ultimately Jesus' death, the death and resurrection and climax of his life. Starting with the first, you're seeing here a fascinating insight into how Jesus Christ, the perfect Son of God, submits himself to sinners. They are his parents. Honor father and mother, it's a command and it matters. But Jesus knows all things. He's the eternal son of God. He's the creator of the universe. And the irony here is that for a brief period of time in his incarnation, Jesus is going to show you that even the creator of the world, the creator of Mary and Joseph, the one who is at that moment giving them life and breath, the reason that their hearts continue to beat and that they continue to breathe is Jesus' command, upholding the universe by the word of his power. And at the same time, he shows you an example of what it means to submit to them and follow them because after all, it's his father and his mother honor father and mother.
And the richness of that then is that Jesus gives you a perfect example of what it means to live life well. And no, you don't have to be more, or you don't have to have parents that are respectable enough for you to follow them. You just honor them because it's a command at the same time. I think even the, the passing comment Jesus made, don't you know that I must be about my father's business, is telling you that there's something future coming something bigger coming, a higher priority. And I'll just compare that with one other statement. So this is the statement we just saw. This is a similar statement. It's the first miracle of Jesus. It's the, the changing of the water to wine. And when Mary asks him to do something to help out with the situation, Jesus' answer to her is, woman, what have I to do with thee? Now I have to explain this. This sounds disrespectful. This woman would be, it would be a, an, an acceptable way to speak to someone, uh, ma'am or lady. And in this case, however, I, I think part of what Jesus is doing is drawing a line. He's making a division here. Now as an adult, I, I, I'm not going to deal with you as, because mother, I must, I'm, I'm, I, you have special access. You're going to see this further out at the cross. Jesus is going to say to John, the disciple, behold your mother, and to, the, to Mary, behold your son. So any kind of Catholic notion that Mary has a special place or special access to Jesus is set aside by statements like this. What have I to do with the, is, is the idea that there is no special access here. I, I, I'm dealing with my father's business. And my priority goes to my father. But the last phrase here points, as I said, to the death. My hour is not yet come. And if you follow that out through the rest of the Gospel of John, you're going to see this over and over. The hour had not yet come. The hour had not yet come. Until you get to John 17, Jesus' prayer, Father, the hour has come. And it's pointing specifically to his death. You realize that even from the earliest days of Jesus' ministry, and even from his childhood, there is the pointer ahead, I will do the will of my Father. Or I am looking ahead to the hour, the day. And all of this then is a pointer ultimately to the cross. I mentioned earlier that scripture gives us relatively little information about the growing up years. I think that's intentional. There is a respectful dignity that the Gospels give on some of the quote-unquote mechanics of Jesus' life. In other words, we affirming Jesus' full humanity could assume that the, the normal experiences of humanity and what it means to be human, you know, bathing yourself, um, taking care of yourself physically, and that kind of thing, if Jesus is fully human, that that's true. But the Gospels respect, maintain a respectful silence on some of those kinds of mechanics. The closest thing we have, we have comments like Jesus slept. We have comments that at the end in Gethsemane, then he sweat drops of blood. So there's the closest thing we have, something like a, a physical pain suffering besides the crucifixion itself. I think all of this is intentional. And yet scripture gives you just enough information to know that the two dynamics we've talked about here are true. Jesus is fully human. Even in his growing up, he is the ultimate example of what life lived correctly would be. And that ultimately, even these growing up years point ahead to the climactic event, the event of the cross. That takes me to talk about the baptism of Christ. And just quickly to look at the overview of that or what that looks like, this is Matthew chapter three. John the Baptist is baptizing in the wilderness in Matthew 3.13, Jesus also comes out to be baptized by John in the wilderness. I think it's very significant in this context that when Jesus comes to be baptized, John forbade him. John's answer is that I have need to be baptized of thee. Thou comest to me? I mean, I am the one who ought to be baptized, and how would you come to me? to ask to be baptized. John, remember, is Jesus' cousin. And it seems that John would have known apparently something about 
Jesus already. In fact, in another context, we read that John says, I myself did not know or did not recognize him until the baptism event. Well, that gives you the impression that John had at least some interaction with Jesus. And kind of what I like what I said earlier, John assumes or thinks that Jesus is a another person, a normal person, but at the same time, you get the impression here that John also knows yet that Jesus has an extraordinarily high moral character, that John realizes Jesus has been righteous. And if you just contrast that with what comes before, John's dealing with the other people who came. As the Pharisees are coming to him, John is very sharp, generation of vipers. Why have you come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits that are fitting for repentance. And do not claim that we have Abraham as our father and that makes you righteous enough. God will deal with you. The axe is laid to the root of the trees. He will cut you down. I mean, John holds back not at all. And when you compare that now with his words to Jesus, his words to Jesus affirm that John knows Jesus to be extraordinarily righteous. But even though John then says to Jesus, you don't need to be baptized this baptism of repentance, Jesus' answer to him is, allow it to be so. That's the concept of suffer. Allow it to be so. There, thus, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness, and John allowed it to happen. So an initial question I would like to ask about this incident, why does Jesus need to be baptized in the first place? When we think baptism, we're thinking of baptism probably in the way that we would experience it. And so it's a, an expression of, um, a, or a testimony that you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ already. And it's an expression that you're turning and you're going to follow after Christ. I think John's baptism is working a little bit differently. John's is a baptism of repentance. What he's doing is he's calling the nation of Israel, or those who would consider themselves to be righteous enough, He's calling them to say, no, you have turned away and fallen, so you need to be restored, you need to be washed, as if you were a Gentile. You need to start over again because you have turned away, you have wandered, you have apostatized from faithfulness to God. And so John's calling people to repent and to make things right. But see, even here, why does Jesus need to do that? Jesus doesn't need to repent. Jesus has no sins to turn away from. Jesus doesn't need a, a fresh beginning. He's not apostatized. He's not wandered away like sheep. And I think there are probably four ideas that we are going to draw out of this. Number one, it is an expression of humility. Jesus has no guilt of his own. He has nothing to repent of. But he feels no need to stand away. He could be perfectly justified standing away on the side and just observing as these mere sinners go down into the water to be cleansed, he has no sin of his own. But I think it's an expression of humility that he is willing to set an example for the sinners and an example then that joins with them, which takes me to the second. Jesus joined with the penitent, the one who had no sin of his own steps into the water together with sinners. Related to what I just said, it's an expression of humility. It's also an, an expression of association. Jesus Christ, the holy righteous one, is also willing to be a friend of sinners, to join in the water together with those who have desperate need for salvation. Third, I think it anticipates Calvary. Uh, there's a future day when Jesus will be surrounded by guilty sinners again. And there's a future day when people will look at him on the cross and they will assume that, look, he must be guilty because he's dying on a cross. This is the ultimate condemnation of someone who's a criminal and wicked. Look at this wicked one. He must have done something awful to deserve being up there. And just as here at the baptism, people will again assume that he's guilty by association, when in fact he's perfectly innocent. The one who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5, became sin for us. And fourth, and finally, through the baptism, Jesus fulfilled 
all righteousness. Now that's the express statement right within the passage itself. So why is he going to be baptized? Thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And the significance of that expression is to say that through this baptism, Jesus is showing that he will fulfill all of the Father's will. Jesus will take, in spite of his total innocence, he will take on our sins, expressing obedience on our behalf. Remember my idea earlier that the events of Jesus' life show that he is doing everything he ought to do. The ultimate example of what a righteous, faithful human would do and be. Well, Jesus fulfills everything the Father gave him to do. He lives a perfectly righteous life. And he does all of this day after day, month after month, year after year, in every different circumstance of human life. And in so doing, he shows you and I the ultimate example of what it means, not just to avoid sin, but also to fulfill all righteousness. Not just to keep from doing bad things, but also to do all of the right things. I quoted a moment ago, 2 Corinthians 5, the one who had no sin became sin for us, but the rest of the verse, that we can be made the righteousness of God in him. The exchange is not just taking away our sin, which is expressed in the baptism of repentance, but it is also fulfilling all righteousness, also expressed in this same baptism. Now, there's a very significant portion after this baptism that we'll return to. I'm going to hold this for a little bit, but I'd like to just point it out so that you recognize what I'm talking about. In the latter part of the baptism, after Jesus is baptized, he came out of the water. The heavens were open to him. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, lighting upon him, or coming, settling upon him, and a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You have here here, Jesus, the Son. You have the Father speaking, that's the voice from heaven. And you have the Spirit of God, that's the Holy Spirit. And this statement is one that we will come back to later. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Very significant and important for interpreting all of Jesus' life and what's happening here at the baptism. But where this passage continues is to the temptation. And immediately after Matthew 4, you read the description of this temptation. So I would like to move to the next major event in Jesus' life, the temptation of Christ, and how then he shows us an example in that as well. The significance here is that Jesus gives you an example of how to respond now to just the pressure to sin, Satan drawing you to sin, and what it means as a human to resist that and to say no. Understanding first the structure of the passage overall. So I'm giving it to you here in a format that you can see the way the passage is naturally, naturally broken down. I won't read all the way through, but just to see the structure here, that there's the first temptation. Jesus answers with a quotation from Scripture. There's the second temptation, and Jesus answers again from Scripture. And now then the third temptation Satan tempts a third time. Jesus answers again from Scripture. Now, that's the structure of it. And the significance of this is that three different times, here and here and here, Jesus each time has answered the temptation with Scripture. One other striking feature of the passage is that notice the quotations from Scripture are not all just from Jesus. These quotations here, two of them, are actually from Satan's mouth. <laughs> and that's striking to recognize that Satan also can use scripture and he can twist scripture in order to be part of the temptation. There are two Old Testament precedents that are important for understanding this temptation. Number one, you should recognize that the temptation is evocative or it reminds you, it's a mirror, it's an echo of the temptation of the nation in the wilderness. So I just showed you these three quotations of the quotations throughout that Jesus gives in response, all of them are taken from Deuteronomy. In one case, it's both Deuteronomy and picking up some information from Exodus. When Jesus answers, all of the quotations are drawn from this period, the period of the wilderness wanderings, the nation wandering about in the wilderness. 
but there's more. The temptation also has echoes, intentional echoes, of specific language in the wilderness wandering era. This is a comparison of some of the, of the language drawn from Deuteronomy 8. I just went through and drew the colors across. So you find that Jesus was led up by the Spirit. So also Israel was led up into the wilderness. Of course, you find the language in the wilderness. You find the language of 40 years with Israel, Jesus 40 days and 40 nights. But I, I don't think those numbers are an accident. The language of proving, or that could be just translated to test or to be tempted. And so Israel is going to be tested. Jesus also was tested. They were hunger, hungry or hungered, and Jesus also became hungry. And in verse 5 in Deuteronomy 8, God deal, dealt with Israel as a son chastening his son. Well, the question that the devil raises, are you really the son? or not. In fact, I could go even further. If you go back to Matthew 2, you're going to get language there of Jesus as the fulfillment drawn from Hosea 4. Israel is my son. Out of Egypt, I have called my son. Well, Jesus is the son, and he's the fulfillment of everything that Israel ought to have been and was not. So I, I do think there's an idea here, an intentional echo. And the way this would work would be something like, Israel was tempted or tested. They faced temptations to complain, to trust, to not trust God, to doubt him, even temptations to idolatry. And when you're reading, therefore, through that section from the middle of Exodus all the way out to Deuteronomy, and you're seeing the constant pattern of Israel failing and sinning and rebelling and turning away, one of the things you're frustrated with, what's wrong with these people? <laughs> Why won't they obey? Why won't they follow? And to be fair, we have to recognize neither do we. But see, the hope of it goes that there is a son coming. There is one coming who will succeed in every way that Israel failed. And the echoes between the two sets of passages are there on purpose to highlight that for you. That where Israel failed in the wilderness, Jesus succeeds. He is faithful in every way that Israel has not been faithful. There's a second echo, and I think the other echo is that Jesus' temptation recapitulates or repeats the first temptation. The first temptation in the history of the world, of course, in Genesis 3, and this is the temptation of Adam and Eve to disobey God's command. Now, of course, it's striking that Satan tempts Adam and Eve. And, and Adam and Eve fail. That's the problem that humanity has faced ever since. I think the argument here goes that where Adam failed, Jesus succeeds. Satan tempted Adam and Adam capitulated. Satan tempts Jesus and he capitulates not at all. There are other parallels here. Do you remember that in the, the temptation we're looking at here, Satan takes the words of God and actually twists them. And so you find Satan making quotes. And Satan can use scripture too. Satan is an exegete and a theologian too, just a very bad one. And the language that he uses here, drawing from scripture, drawing from two different passages in the Old Testament, it's actually a, a fairly good use of scripture, except drawing it to the wrong conclusion. I mean, Satan even knows how to interpret in context. He just applies it wrong on purpose. And if you recall the original temptation back in Genesis 3, you'll discover that Satan did that before. The last time also, Satan took God's words. Has God really said, Oh, he says, but God knows that if you take of the fruit, then you will become like God's, knowing good and evil. This is not the first time that Satan has taken God's words, lifted them up, picked them up, and then twisted them in the wrong directions. Notice also that core to the entire temptation here, it's wrapped around Jesus' identity. Notice the questions that Satan raises. If you are the Son of God, do these things. Again, if you are the Son of God, 
do these things. And finally, Satan's temptation to him, I will give you all of this glory, this kingdom, if only you will fall down and worship me. So it's wrapped around the basic questions, Jesus' identity. Is he really the son of God? Will Jesus prove that he's the son of God? And second, Jesus' right to receive the kingdoms of the world. And if you compare that again with Adam's original temptation, remember that Satan's promise to Adam and Eve, if you would take the fruit, then you would be like God's. It's kind of an attempt to raise yourself up to a status that is not rightfully yours. And you could claim or pretend to be something you aren't. Godhead, you would be like God's. See, but it's striking here that Satan offers instead to Jesus something that already is his. He is, in fact, the Son of God. And the temptation can't be that you will then become like God. Jesus already is. And so Satan questions now just reality. Or in the case of offering Jesus the kingdoms of the world, Satan's contention is, I'll give you all of this, when in fact it already belongs to Jesus. It is his. The parallel between Genesis 3 and Matthew 4 is strong. Just as before, Satan offered for Adam and Eve to be like gods. Jesus, Satan also calls up Jesus' identity as God. And that becomes the core of the temptation. But the difference is that Jesus actually has the right to that, to that already. One systematic theology question that I'm glad for us to discuss here, it's the problem of whether Jesus can truly be tempted. Okay, so we have the statement here that Jesus was brought up into the wilderness to be tempted. And the clear statement then that he was tempted means that, okay, we have to affirm, we ought to affirm that Jesus could be and was authentically tempted to sin. The theological or systematic struggle of this is when we look at the passages and we read language like this, God cannot deny himself. Or the statement that no one should say he, when he is tempted, he's tempted by God. God cannot be tempted with evil neither tempteth he any man. So it, it's possible to look at this and say, okay, well then clearly Jesus can't be God. God cannot deny himself. God is not able to sin like this. God cannot be tempted with evil. It's not even possible. But look, I have this statement that Jesus was tempted. And therefore you could use this, I suppose, to try to deny the deity of Christ. And a couple of things that I'd like to explore with that, for starters. Though we have statements to the effect that God cannot be tempted with evil, we do also have statements that use the same language in reference to God. So Acts 15, why do you therefore tempt God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples? Or actually right within this passage itself, here's a command, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God. It's a command not to do this thing. Well, I mean, if it's just as simple as saying it's impossible anyway, why even give a command? for starters. Why, why give a command for something that's impossible to do? And the difference between these is just, okay, thinking carefully through what it means to tempt God. God cannot be tempted with evil would be that there is no desire in God that's drawn out or that he wants to do evil. I mean, the experience of a human to look at evil and, and want it, desire, crave, lust after it, God has no desire. God is as interested in evil as you and I might be interested in picking up a dead animal on the side of the road and, and devouring it. There's just no desire at all. It's a disgusting concept to us. I think that's the concept here. And furthermore, a lot of the confusion here with what it means that God cannot be tempted with evil, we're just getting into more philosophical categories. What does could mean? What is the possibility? So if our deeper question here goes, is there a small chance that God might sin? Or is there a small chance that Jesus would sin? As though we're kind of rolling dice and 99.999 times he won't sin, but there's that tiny chance that just maybe it's gonna happen. Okay, no, there was no chance that Jesus would sin. It was impossible. If we mean the ability 
if what we're talking about is did Jesus have kind of the physical capability of doing some of these things? Or another maybe better way to say it, did Jesus have an authentic choice? And the answer is, well, yes. Jesus had an authentic choice, and he always chose to say no. It was a meaningful and true and legitimate choice, and Jesus refused. So in that, we have to be careful not to use one passage to deny the truth of the other passage. We have to maintain both passages as true. There was no chance that Jesus would sin. And yet he made a legitimate, authentic, and true choice. It was something that he had to choose to do to obey. And the significance of this for us theologically is now if we watch the way the New Testament itself will develop this idea. So looking at Hebrews chapter 2, in that he himself has suffered being tempted. I mean, he has legitimately experienced temptation. He is able to help those that are tempted. Hebrews 4, he was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. And that means then you can't say that he doesn't understand the feeling of our infirmities. He understands it all. Hebrews 5, he can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way. For that he himself is compassed with infirmity, surrounded by infirmity. His whole life was filled with pain, difficulty, sorrow. He's experienced this. Hebrews 5, 7, in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he were, and that he feared, though he were a son, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all that obey him. Now, I, I think the helpful thing about all of these passages then is that we're seeing Jesus is not cut off from our struggle. Jesus knows what it is to experience human suffering and sorrow. He lived that. He experienced that as well. There's also a critical distinction here. And that is, it's tempting to just blithely dismiss the theological significance of Jesus' temptation by thinking something like, okay, well, he was God. So it was easy for him to say no. Of course he said no, but... But me, I'm, I'm, I'm a weak human, and so therefore I struggle with temptation in a way that he doesn't. And I, I can't give a full answer to that now just with the constraints of time. I, I would argue, however, here, that because Jesus said no perfectly to temptation, and because God promises to us that he has offered to us no temptation, which, is, which we will fall to, but no temptation is taken to us, that we will have sufficient way of escape. Let's recognize that Jesus, the infinite Son of God, faced temptation and certainly faced pain and sorrow on a level that you and I will never experience and probably can't even comprehend. So I deal with sin, I deal with struggle, I deal with sorrow. Jesus carried all the world's sorrow. All of it fell on him. I deal with temptation, but Jesus was tempted by Satan himself across 40 days in the desert without food, and more significantly facing temptation on a level that no other human being has ever been able to sustain. And he did it all righteously. Part of the way that we wrongly reason here is well Jesus was God so he had the powerful he had the power to do miracles and so he he could have just done something for himself notice even the way that the temptation itself is constructed Jesus is hungry Satan says to him if you are the son of God command that these stones be made bread now this is Jesus who later fed 5,000 and fed 4,000 this is Jesus who absolutely has the power to change stones into bread and the significance of it goes Jesus holds the power to perform miracles but he does it never for his own benefit 
and the pattern of Jesus withholding the power that is rightfully his. He has all of the rights and the privilege of deity, and he will use that power to perform miracles for the sake of those he came to serve. But the one who fed thousands refuses to feed himself because his power is not for himself, but he uses it for those he came to save. See, that expresses the rich beauty of what our Savior has done on our behalf. Never dismiss Jesus' victory by saying blithely that, well, he was God, and recognize instead that he suffered and succeeded in a way that you and I cannot even imagine. Now, that supports the one side of the two themes we're tracing. Jesus Christ is an example of how to live life correctly. And in respect to temptation, then, we see that example. He did everything he ought to have done. But it also, remember, we have also the second theme pointing to the cross. Is there a connection between the temptation and the cross? I would call your attention back to the passages we looked at in Hebrews. These were the passages talking about the fact that he is acquainted with infirmity, that he was made in all points like as we are, and he's acquainted then with what it feels like to face temptation, yet without sin. Okay, now read carefully in the last passage we looked at. In the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he was feared, he learned obedience by the things he suffered. What does this refer to? And on closer inspection, you realize it's actually not talking about Matthew 4, the temptation from Satan, but it's actually talking about this incident. That he began to be very sorrowful, and he said, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. And he cries out to the Father, If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. On closer inspection, you realize that the temptation of Christ recorded in Matthew 4 and the other Gospels is not the only instance of temptation. But it goes much further to Gethsemane. Arguably, Jesus' entire life is a daily answer to the struggle of sin. He's daily choosing to do the right thing every single day. He is daily choosing to turn away from the wrong responses and to fulfill his Father's will in all of his life. But you see that climactically expressed in Gethsemane when he expresses here that he, facing the sorrow, feels the full pressure of that temptation. And his response is beautifully, not my will, but Father, your will be done. I mean, he has the desire to have this cup pass from him. He has the desire to seek another way, and he, re he submits himself to the Father's will for him. Which moves me to the next event we'll talk about in Jesus' life, and that is the Transfiguration. The Transfiguration recorded in Matthew 17, it's following right after the classic confession of Peter. Peter, understanding who Jesus is, confesses, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus immediately begins to teach the disciples that he must suffer, that he will be rejected by the high priest, that he will be crucified, and on the third day he will rise again. And that brings us to Matthew 17, just the next chapter after that classic incident. Jesus took Peter, James, and John, brought them to a high mountain. He was transfigured or transformed before them. His face shined as the sun. His raiment was white as the light. This language is an echo, probably, of some descriptions that we have in at the throne room of God, particularly Daniel 7, the Ancient of Days, and his raiment shines like light, his face shining like the sun, also Ezekiel 1 and 10, and later we find the same description appearing in Revelation 1 of Jesus. So there's something here expressing that Jesus has the glory of the Father. A comment I would like to make here, Jesus was transformed, meaning that you saw the glory of Jesus Christ briefly, temporarily in a flash. And I think a good framework to have here is that this is the glory that was always rightfully Jesus. Jesus is. 
From eternity past, we know, John 17, Jesus had the glory of the Father. He lays that aside by his choice. He humbles himself, Philippians 2, even to the point of death. What you've got in the transfiguration, however, is this beautiful reminder that it's not just at the end of his life that Jesus deserves the glory. Philippians 2 talks about God also has highly exalted him. It's not just that Jesus received a glory that was not previously his, but even in the middle of his life, that glory is still, yes, rightfully his. He has chosen voluntarily to lay aside what is his, but it still belongs to him. It is still his own. And the fascinating thing about this, the rest of this framework, the rest of this narrative, is now that it's focused on, we'll develop this idea, Jesus speaking for God or Jesus as the declarer of truth about God. Watch, watch what I mean. There appeared to him Moses and Elijah. Why the two of them? Probably because Moses and Elijah are representative as the climactic expressions of Moses, the law, Elijah, the prophet. So the greatest of the prophets. They're appearing to him, speaking with him. And Peter's impressed with all of this. Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Um, Peter obviously has made some kind of mistake. We are tempted to think that it has something to do with the tabernacles. And so I've, I've heard people talk about this in the framework. Peter is wrongly thinking, let's just stay here forever. This is great. Why would we want to leave this mountain? I don't know that that's the core of the error that Peter made. Because the answer that comes highlights for us what went wrong. While he yet spake, I mean, while Peter is still saying this, a bright cloud overshadowed them. A voice came out of the cloud. This language of a bright cloud even reminds us of the cloud in the wilderness or the cloud filling the temple. I mean, it's a clear statement of the presence of God. And that voice said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Listen to him. Okay, pause for a second to recognize what's going on with this expression and just to put it into context with other passages. Here's the statement we're looking at in the Transfiguration. Three parts. This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And you'll recognize in that that this is an echo of a statement that was made before. I left this out there for our attention before, but in Jesus' baptism, you had the same statement with one change. But this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We've heard that expression before. So it's helpful to recognize at the starting place that the baptism and the transfiguration are connected. Both of them are clear declarations from God himself. In the case of the trans or the baptism, Father and Holy Spirit, that this is the one, this is the Son, this is the Messiah. But we have to recognize some context for that drawn across the Old Testament. And four different passages that do this. Very striking to notice the roots here. First, Psalm 2, the Son. This, we've looked at this passage before, the son who is put in parallel with God himself, Yahweh. Kiss the son, lest he be angry with you and you be destroyed. So the son as king, universal king. Related to that, you have language here in Isaiah, not the son language, but my servant, my chosen one. Okay, so the one who's chosen, the servant, is also the Messiah, the son. But now watch how we add language to that. In whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. The language of I have put my spirit upon him reminds you of the baptism, doesn't it? Because in that case, you saw the spirit of God descending on him. Now, that's not the moment when Jesus was filled with the spirit. We'll return to that in a little bit. Jesus had the spirit or was filled with the spirit from the very beginning. But we see then a clear demonstration to anyone who's watching that Jesus has the Spirit, he is the Messiah, and he is the one in whom God delights. Similarly, Psalm 22, he trusts in the Lord, let God deliver him, let him rescue him, for he delights in him. And a comment on that is to say, as you read across the Old Testament, everyone has always failed, every human, every prophet, every priest, every king. 
Israel itself has failed. The very best of humanity, Abraham, Moses, David, they all sinned. They all failed. They all fell short. And to be able to say that there is one that God delights in, one that God has chosen, one that is after God's heart, God's preferences, God's desires, one who actually does everything that God gave him to do. Who can say that? Who can say that God fully and unqualifiedly de delights in them? Only the Messiah has brought about that kind of righteous living. See, but there's more here, and this is a connection we'll continue to build on. Remember Psalm 22 is the passage that elsewhere talks about them taking his garments, gambling for them. It even has the language that they've put holes through his hands and his feet. I mean, strong crucifixion type language. And if you recognize this language, this language got picked up again. Yes, at Jesus' crucifixion, when they mocked him, he delights in, he let God deliver him if God delights in him, they said. They quoted this psalm. And so you have already the anticipation, even in the baptism, even in the transfiguration, pointing ahead to Jesus' future death. The final piece in terms of Old Testament roots is this language that you listen to him. And this was the idea we were starting to develop a moment ago. So Moses and Elijah are there. They're the two great prophets, the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. And Jesus stands among them. And the impression that Peter receives is, well, this is amazing. This is extraordinarily, extraordinary and beautiful. So let's build tabernacles. Let's make this a thing that we do. Jesus Parallel with Moses and Elijah, how great could anyone be? And I think the critical error of Peter's words goes that he wanted three tabernacles, Moses, Elijah, Jesus. And the voice from the crowd, from the cloud corrects and says, no, Jesus does not just belong as one of the three greats. Oh, Moses, Elijah, parallel to them. Jesus is, wow, so great. He's as great as Moses. That's not it at all. This one is unique. This one is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Moses and Elijah, good people. They were faithful to God, but not like this. Jesus Christ has been faithful, Hebrews language, as a son. He has perfectly fulfilled all of God's expectations. And this language then that you listen to him is probably drawn or at least parallel to the famous Deuteronomy 18 passage where God says he will raise up a prophet from among you, from your brothers. Moses says he will be greater. It is to him you shall listen. And you can follow this, prof this pattern across even in the Gospels. They had the expectation, when will the prophet greater than Moses come? The prophet who is the climactic prophet. Well, in these words, God has identified Jesus as that prophet, even intentionally in contrast to Moses. Moses was great. Elijah was great. But Jesus is the son. Listen to him. And what that means then is that the point of the transfiguration, or one of the critical points, is that you're seeing a picture of Jesus' glory, you're seeing his greatness, you're seeing the beauty of who he is, but there's so much more. Jesus is the climactic revelation of God. He is the word. Listen to him. That then takes me to note one other connection, and this is now in 2 Peter. So this is Peter. He's reflecting back. He's the very one who made this mistake in Matthew 17. And he recounts, the voice came to him from the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And then Peter continues just processing this. We ourselves heard this very voice. I mean, one could be tempted to say, this is the highest and greatest experience. You heard God speak. And you saw the glory of the Messiah. How much greater could it possibly be than that? Jesus, Peter continues, We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you do well to pay attention. And in context, what he's talking about is the New Testament. 
We have now received a much greater prophecy. The New Testament now is God's writing down, interpreting, and explaining to us what it means that Jesus came, lived, died, and rose again. Peter says, don't crave an experience. Oh, but if only I could see Jesus' glory. Don't crave a, a, a direct experience like hearing the voice come from the cloud. That's not it. If you want to hear the greatest and climactic expression, we have God's words. And I think that fits perfectly with the language of the transfiguration itself. This is my son. I am well pleased with him. Listen to what he says. Peter applies that to say, when you read the New Testament, you're reading the words, the theology, the explanation of Jesus Christ. How does this fit into the framework that we've been pursuing as we talk about each one of these? each one of these theological realities. Well, starting out, we can say that we see the richness of Jesus' perfectly lived life when he holds back or he does not display his full glory throughout his entire life. I mean, he deserves the glory that you see at the transfiguration. He has the right to be shining like the sun. And for his entire life, he refused to display that. For his entire life, he humbled himself and he lived among sinning humans. But I think most obviously within the passage, the words are right there. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. In what way does Jesus show us the example of a perfectly lived life? Like this, he shows us that he perfectly, always, continually pleased the Father in everything. What does it mean to live well? It means to live like Jesus. It means to live in a way that pleases the Father. But we also saw right within that passage, the roots tied to Psalm 22. Let God deliver him if he's pleased with him. And the connections that take us out to the cross, when people will throw those words in front of Jesus and ironically, unknowingly fulfill the prophecy of Psalm 22 at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. In other words, even in the transfiguration, we see an anticipation of Jesus' coming crucifixion, his glory as expressed in his willingness to humble himself and die on the cross. The final event in Jesus' life or pattern in Jesus' life we'll discuss is Jesus' miracles. You can go across the New Testament or across the Gospels and find an extraordinary number of these miracles. There are probably about 37 different specific miracles that the Gospels record. But you have to pay attention to statements like this. When Jesus comes and he heals all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And so his fame spreads across entire vast regions. And they bring to him all the sick people with all different kinds of diseases and torments. And all that are possessed with evil, devils. And those that are insane. Those that had palsy. And he heals them all. Okay, now I'm just going to click through the number of passages you have like that, where Jesus just heals everybody. They bring them all, and they're all healed. It's amazing. Concluding with the end of John and the end of the Gospels, there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which. If they should be written, every one, I suppose, even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. <laughs> okay, so can we say this? Jesus did a lot of miracles. And why? What's the point? Several streams or strands of information that will help us interpret these. First of all, you can see that Jesus' miracles authenticated his message. So you have passages where someone will come and say, you must be from God. No man can do these miracles that you do except God is with you. Uh, multitudes follow him because they see the miracles. People believe on him and they ask questions like, when the Messiah comes, how could he possibly do more miracles than this man has done? Even Jesus' enemies are amazed. This man cannot be God, of God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others say, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And they're mentally struggling with this question. Later in their counsel, they'll ask, what will we do? This man does so many miracles. If we let him alone, everyone will believe on him. See, his miracles end up confirming and and giving a, a great uh, authentication behind his message. 
one other passage that works like this, John 12, 37. They had done so many miracles, or he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. And this is the opposite of the passages I've read up before. Uh, everything before was illustrating that Jesus did miracles and that brought about faith. But I end with this passage just to say, we ought to carefully nuance our understanding of this a little bit. Miracles did authenticate Jesus' message. And it did prove sufficiently enough that Jesus was from God. We ought to recognize, however, that the nature of the human heart, the hardness of hearts, is such that even with indisputable miracles, people will still find a way to doubt. And you find this also as a pattern throughout the Gospels. One of the most striking comes in at the beginning of Mark 8. Jesus has just fed 4,000 people, and the Pharisees come about seeking a sign. See, if you want to reject, you can. And even though he did many miracles, people still reject it. So there is a further purpose for the miracles, not just for the purpose of authenticating his message. But secondly, the miracles actually fulfilled specific prophecy. The Old Testament said that the Messiah would come doing miracles. A couple of ways we see this. This is John the Baptist. When he heard in prison the works of the Messiah, he sent two of his, his disciples. Now notice, it's specifically when he heard the works, the miracles, when he heard what Jesus was doing. And John is now starting to, he's confused, but he's wondering, is Jesus the Messiah? Are you the one who would come or do we look for another? Jesus' answer to John, notice very specifically what he uses to confirm that he is the Messiah. Go and show John again those things which you see and hear. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And that's Jesus' answer to John's doubts. Doubt me no more. I am the Messiah, and here's why. Why? Because Isaiah 35, 5, the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, the lame man shall leap as a deer, the tongue of the dumb will sing, in the wilderness shall waters break out in streams in the desert. Jesus is actually quoting from Old Testament prophecy. And he's saying, remember what you read about the coming Messiah? I am that. I'm doing that. And this certifies who I am. Similarly, Luke 4, 16, he came to Nazareth, this is his hometown. As his custom was, he went to the synagogue and he stood up to read. And they brought the book of the prophet Isaiah. So he opened the book, he found the place where this was written and he read it. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight of, to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, this is drawn, and you can read Isaiah 61. It's just drawn directly from that. Jesus reads that. He closed the book. He sat down. And all the eyes of those in the synagogue are looking at him. So why did you read this passage? I mean, because it's the language of upon me. And, and they know some of the things he's done. They know that he has given sight to the blind. They know that he has preached the gospel to the poor. So are you really saying that? Are you really claiming to be that? He began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Jesus claimed that he was the fulfillment to the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah, specifically the miracles that the Messiah would accomplish. There is one more connection. And if you notice some of the Old Testament promises about the coming of the Messiah, and what this will mean. And some of these promises are stretched out into what you and I would recognize as the millennium or the eternal state. The idea, as we read in Revelation, that every tear will be wiped away. Now, watch some of the language in these passages. This is the passage we just read, but it's actually an eschatological or future in an eternity kind of passage. 11.6, Isaiah. The wolf also will dwell with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the kid, the calf, the young lion, the fatling together, a little child shall lead them. And it describes a change even in the animal kingdom. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. None of this was fulfilled in Jesus' ministry, not entirely. But I think what's going on here is that you are seeing a foreshadowing. You're seeing a little foretaste of what eternity will be like. 
And we could look at other passages like this, Isaiah 65, that Jesus coming brings about rejoicing and joy. Weeping will be heard no more. Revelation 21, 4, God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. The former things are passed away. Jesus coming, his first coming, was not a complete fulfillment of these things. There was still suffering and pain during the time Jesus was on earth. People still died. And in fact, the people that Jesus raised from the dead later on died again. Okay, so we recognize this at the same time. I think part of what we're seeing beautifully in these passages is if you want to know what it will look like when Jesus reigns as king over all things, here's a foretaste of it. Here's a picture that can begin early. You can already see some of the richness of the promise of this, that even in his first coming, Jesus took away suffering, sickness, sorrow, and death. Now, if that was the first coming, wait until the day when he reigns as uncontested king forever and ever. And it's critical to recognize that the source of all of this healing and this hope is in his person. He is the source of the victory, so also in eternity. As you saw Jesus giving life and hope to all who came, Jesus also in eternity will wipe every tear away so that those who have come to him will rejoice forever in the new life and the new creation that he brings. Which allows me now to summarize the different patterns that we've seen which e with each of these events in Jesus' life. I've highlighted with each of these events that Jesus is the example for how we ought to live, and that each one of these events also points ahead to his coming death, starting with Jesus' early life. Jesus, in his early life as God, as creator of the universe, still submits himself to Mary and Joseph. And therefore, he shows you what ideal growing up would look like. But he also recognizes that there's something further in the future. He's going about his father's business, or in John's account, my hour has not yet come. Even in his early life, Jesus still is pointing towards his death and his resurrection. So also his baptism. In his baptism, Jesus fulfilled all righteousness. He also identified with the guilty in a way that would never be completely fulfilled or brought to its fruition apart from the cross. And at the cross then, he would fully identify with the sinners that he came to save. In the temptation, Jesus Christ succeeded where Israel and Adam failed. He shows us righteous living. But the temptation also points far beyond to Gethsemane. In the transfiguration, Jesus pleases the Father. This is the Son in whom I am well pleased. But you can find right around the transfiguration and immediately after his words to the disciples, tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. Even the transfiguration and its glory points ahead to his ultimate glorification. In the miracles, Jesus never acts for his own benefit. He always acts for the benefits of those he came to save. And a link that we did not make earlier is that in Matthew's account, Matthew 8, you actually find a really fascinating incident where Matthew will talk about miracles and then he links it to Isaiah 53. And he says that Jesus gave hope and victory over this suffering. He freed people from their sorrow and their sickness because, citing Isaiah 53, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. In fact, theologically, I think the link would go that the reason that Jesus is able to heal and take away all of this sorrow is because he takes it upon himself at the cross. Ultimately, he deals with our sorrow. But there's one more link, and I think this link stretches out across all of the incidents we've looked at. And the question goes, Jesus being filled by the Holy Spirit. I'm just going to give you the two conclusions and then I'll substantiate them. But Jesus lived out a perfect life because he lived, he worked, and ministered by the power of the Spirit. And also connected to his coming death, we discover that even the pouring out of the Spirit at Pentecost is a result, ultimately, of Jesus' victory in the cross. So I'm assuming in both of those points, with the Holy Spirit and relationship to Jesus, I'm assuming this question, was Jesus filled with the Holy Spirit? Did Jesus have the Holy Spirit? 
Did Jesus minister by the power of the Holy Spirit? And this is a question that can tangle us a, a little bit, tangle us up a little bit, because we might think, why would Jesus need the Holy Spirit? Why would he need to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit? After all, he's, he's God. So in what sense does he need the Holy Spirit's indwelling to accomplish his work? I'd like to challenge us to sharpen that thinking a little bit, and for several, several reasons. First of all, let's recognize that the filling of the Holy Spirit is a critical part of the Old Testament prophecies about the coming Messiah. Look at Isaiah 11. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. If you're working through the context, it's a clear messianic passage. And this is even the explanation for why he's righteous and just in dealing with the nations, because the spirit is upon him. Isaiah 42, 1, Behold my servant whom I uphold in whom my soul delights. I have my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the nations. If you recognize this, this is language we just looked at, fulfilled in the baptism and the transfiguration. My soul, my, my self is pleased in him. I am well pleased in him, the Messiah, the servant. But it's the spirit also that God has placed upon him, enabling him. Isaiah 61, 1, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. This is the passage, remember, that Jesus quoted in the synagogue and read out loud and declared, this day it is fulfilled. This language of anointed is the language of the Messiah. So identifying himself as the Messiah. The striking thing in three different Old Testament passages, they talk about the Spirit filling Jesus. A few New Testament extensions of this. Luke 4, Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. This is just after the baptism and just before the temptation. So what comes next in Luke 4, 2 is the temptation account, Satan tempting Jesus. And it's after that temptation, Luke 4, verse 14, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And a few verses later, when he stands in the synagogue and reads this passage, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Okay, so it should be clear enough and beyond any doubt. I mean, multiple passages to demonstrate it, explicit statements. Yes, Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, there's more. You even find that Jesus did his works by the power of the Spirit, at least some of the time. So Matthew 12, 28, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And Jesus asserts that he has done these miracles by the power of the Spirit. And you find even here in verse 14, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. So you discover that Jesus actually performed many of his miracles also, not even by his own power, but by the Spirit's power. And that point could be a little troublesome. I mean, you could think, and you wouldn't be wrong, wait, is this right? The idea that Jesus did not do his own works by his own power, but by the power of the Spirit. Does this mean he lacked that power himself? On the contrary, I would want to assert and maintain, let's recognize that Jesus did and always had the power to accomplish these miracles on his own for certainty. So this was not a case of Jesus lacking the power and then somehow by God's granting it, now he has the power. Jesus always had the, the power from eternity past. He's the creator of the universe after all. But I think part of the richness of this pattern, do you realize that though he had that power and though he could perform miracles on his own as truly and fully God equal with the Father. Jesus does not need the Spirit's help to perform miracles. I think the richness of this is that Jesus chose to depend on the Spirit's power. He set aside the power that was rightfully his, and he depended on the power of the Spirit to do what he already could have done, but which he chose instead to depend upon the Spirit's power. You find this pattern also with the Father. Jesus will strongly emphasize across the Gospel of John that he does not do his works by himself, but he does and fulfills the commands of the Father. And the works that he does then are the Father's works. 
Jesus has all right and all power to perform miracles on his own, but the Trinity always acts together. And when you see Jesus working, you see him actually acting, laying aside his own power to work by the power of the Spirit to do things he could do, but he chooses voluntarily to depend upon God's power. I'd like to show you just how rich and thick this pattern goes, and then we'll draw some conclusions that summarize the rest of this lecture. This is the theologian Herman Bavinck, and he comments that prophecy already announced that the Messiah would be anointed in a special sense with the Holy Spirit. We just saw some of those passages. The New Testament tells us that Christ received that Spirit without measure. Not only did he receive the Spirit, the Spirit descended on him at the baptism, completely filled him, led him into the wilderness, into Galilee, to give him past power to cast out demons, to offer himself up to God without blemish, to be designated Son of God in power by his resurrection as Lord with a glorified body, just as he had become Son of David in the way of the flesh, thus to vindicate himself as such before the eyes of all, to leave the earth, to ascend to heaven, to manifest himself to his own as life-giving Spirit, who is the Spirit and who works by the Spirit. You can look at all of these passages, and each one of these passages links the different works of Jesus Christ from miracles to temptation to baptism and all the way to resurrection, his death, resurrection, and glorification linked to the Spirit. The only comment I would like to make just to sharpen this up a little bit more is to recognize that it's not just the Spirit coming upon Jesus at his baptism. We would want to affirm, looking at the virgin birth or virgin conception passage in Matthew 1, that Jesus had the Spirit from the very beginning. But you see the Spirit clearly declared as upon him as it's represented there in the baptism. And what would be the theological significance of all of this or how would we apply it? Remember our ideas. Remember the two threads that we followed throughout in all of the events of Jesus' life. Jesus' life, his perfectly lived righteous life, shows us that we ought to see through his life the anticipation of his death at Calvary. And you ought to think then, as you read about the Spirit, and Jesus filled with the Spirit, and what he's doing by the power of the Spirit, that the climactic event of his life will be him offering himself up and dying and being raised again by the power of the Spirit, so that then he sends forth the promise of the Spirit. And therefore, all of the references to the Spirit across the gospel are pointing ahead to Pentecost and the victory that Jesus Christ won. The gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 is the fulfillment and the climax of what Jesus accomplished in Matthew 1 through John 21. But that makes another and even deeper link. Remember my idea that the Gospels and Jesus' life are showing you a life perfectly well lived. What would it mean to live righteously and to do it right? Jesus is that answer. Jesus shows you a life righteously lived. Okay, now part of the beauty of that then is that you should realize God calls us to depend upon the power of the Spirit. We're indwelt by the Spirit. We ought to rely on the power of the Spirit so that we see the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And relying on the power of the Spirit is not anything necessarily mystical. Obey his words. Do what he told you to do. Follow his commands and recognize that you can't do it in your own power. He's the source of your power. Okay, but the richness of that is that he doesn't just call us to do something without giving us an example. But Jesus himself relied on the power of the Spirit. Jesus, who could have done these works in his own self and his own power, chooses instead, humbly, to lay down that power, to depend on the power of the Spirit, just as he calls us to depend on the power of the Spirit. And Jesus then sets the example for us in every aspect of Christian living. How would you live righteously in the week, the month, or the years before you? And the answer is, well, by the power of the Spirit. Or you could say, be like Jesus. And I've said the same thing twice, because Jesus himself set this example. Here is the picture of a life perfectly lived. Here is the picture of what it means to do all that God would call a human to do and be. Jesus is that picture. Jesus defines righteous humanity. Jesus defines a life 
well lived. And that life righteously lived finds its rich conclusion as we've seen in the climactic event of his life, which is his death and his resurrection. And that's the topic of our next discussion. Our next lecture will talk about Jesus' great victory in his death and resurrection, but even that gives us hope. For if Jesus showed us a righteous life lived out perfectly, he shows us also a righteous death, and he gives us hope in that death because we will not stay dead, but as Jesus rose again, we also will live again. Following then our master and our king, we follow him to live out our lives righteously as he did. We follow him to die in hope and confidence as he did. And we will follow him to rise again victoriously as our king and our master also lives and reigns for all eternity.